All right, everybody, welcome back to the weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Uh, you're listening to Mike Lippolito, and my, I'm here with my empathic co-host, uh, Mr. Tyler Neville. Empathic. You know why you got empathic? Because you've got these great Psychological Tuesday newsletters, and you really hit the nail on the head, my friend. You're a good understander of people. I will, I will say that. I don't know if it's that or it's just that, like... I have a lot of friends still stuck in the legacy world of finance who complain to me like religiously. <laughs> so it's it's kind of you hear it through one ear and you're like literally everybody's talking about it. They were talking about it for years. You go to business dinners and they're all like, dude, you know, my, my pay went down another 20% this year. And you're like, well, you know, until it gets painful enough, you're not going to make a change. So I think we're at that point now. Anyway, that's fine. I'm pretty sure the way change gets made is when you bundle up a bunch of analysts, and then you put it together in a PowerPoint presentation, and then you send it out over Twitter. Uh, mm-hmm. If I learned one thing from Goldman, yeah. you know what the irony of that is? That like everyone else responded to that, except for Goldman. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Like Apollo was like, hey, we're going to pay you more money. And these other friends were like, hey, take a week off. And Goldman was like, here, take a gift, ba- gift basket. So <laughs> that's... Uh, that's pretty funny. I think. Nice. I think that was a missed opportunity, though, that whole thing, because, you know, some firm could have just been like, hey, we really appreciate all the hard work everyone's doing during the pandemic. Take a week off. And it would have been amazing PR. It would have stood out. Mm-hmm. But whatever. All right, let's give the, the people the rundown of what we're talking about this week. Uh, so we are going to be talking about, um, okay, there's a dip in uh, yields on the 10-year. So... Look like we're up to 1.75 uh, for a period of time. Now we're down to 1.5. You're going to be answering the question: Is has some form of soft yield curve control started already? Uh, so that's topic number one. Uh, Got to talk about um, the direct listing of Coinbase, one of the largest, um, I guess, public listings. It's not an IPO, but it's a direct listing of uh, of all time. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Uniswap V3 and just how amazing uh, of a business model that is overall. Uh, and then finally, we're going to be talking about more hedgies getting in the mix of Bitcoin. Uh, Brevin Howard and Dan Loeb um, finally kind of tossing their hat in the ring in a more direct way than they have before. So lots of good stuff. It. Yeah, lots of good oh, stuff yeah. to cover this week. All right, I'm going to I'm going to tee you up here because you've been talking about this for a little while. Um, but basically, we're seeing a dip in uh, in um, yields on the 10 year. Uh, so we're at 1.75. Uh, falling about 25 basis points to about 1.5, um, you know, as of the time of this recording. Uh, I think you can, there are two pretty interesting things going on there with that. Um, you know, Richard Clarita has come out and said, um, which you pointed out, and I haven't heard much chatter about this, that they're going to match uh, purchases with issuance, which uh, in Fence speak kind of, you know, alludes to yield curve control. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, that was a real odd comment. And no one really made mention of it, but here's here's the math, right? There was 373 billion of issuance over the past three weeks in April, and if the Fed can only buy 80 billion of that, then the gap of that needs to be made up by you know foreign investors. Now there is an increase in buying from Jap- Japanese investors now for a variety of reasons. I think the life insurance companies over there are doing their yearly allocation of fixed income again and probably bought an increased amount. I think it was like 20 billion, but that still leaves a lot of wood to chop, right? 373 yeah. billion um, versus 100 billion if you add in 20 from the life insurers. So there's just too much supply and it makes me think that the Fed is really buying more than their the treasury is issuing. And we mm-hmm. saw a pump of, of over their 80 billion allocation the past like month or so. So I think they're buying more than they say they say they are and they think it'll smooth out eventually. But I, that's why I think it's like a soft yield control. We're seeing it in Australia, we're seeing it in, in Europe. It's kind of like out there now. So I th- and not only that, but we also saw in that big run up in treasury yields, hedge funds came in shorted the crap out of the bond market. This is known as the bond vigilantes, right? They short it, expect yields to rise. And I think that created on Thursday, the big fall in yields it is, is some of those hedge funds got stopped out of their shorts. And basically that's why we saw that like pretty big move down to 1.5 on the 10 year. 
So I think that's sort of what's going on. And we'll, we'll check the, the numbers of Fed purchases, but I guess I'm, I'm moving slower and slower over into the, the markets. The Fed put is super strong. Mm. You know, I think we're still going to see a rotation into value from tech, but tech might still go up, right? I think that's the hard thing is everyone thinks, oh, it's a rotation, you know, but it, value will be a relative outperformer from tech. We're going to see, you know, inflationary impulses, but the Fed's going to be there to stop it. They just can't afford not to. Yeah. And yield curve control has been, um, you know, a word that gets bandied around quite a bit. Can you talk a little bit about what is the status of the environment right now? That Why is there so much attention being paid to yield curve control? Why do a lot of people think that it's coming down the pike? I think the deficits are so big and there's the world is short aggregate demand, right? They, they need to make up the gap from all the demand that dropped during the pandemic and the feds coming in and, and playing that role along with central banks around the world. And, you know, the deficit is at a generational like low, meaning they need to make up the gap of spending by issuing debt. And that's, that's basically what's going on. Governments are, their finances are piss poor. It's kind of like, you know, overspending your, your salary, right? You're putting your, you're putting your lifestyle on your credit card and hoping that your earnings, your earnings growth on your salary goes up to pay for that interest expense, except they have the ability to control interest expense with monetary policy. So that's sort of what's going on around the world. And I think it's just creating this giant arb, like, if you can't raise rates, you need to finance everything at low rates as governments. You have control of that. It's just an, uh, a yield arbitrage because money is slowly flowing into crypto, which creates a steep futures curve, and it creates higher interest rates and ability to borrow and, and pay out 8% yields. So you just see what I've said in my newsletter is, is your Bank of America account or JP Morgan account, you're getting 2.25% interest. But over in BlockFi, you're getting 8.6 or even higher if you go out to some of these other, you know, stablecoin um, interest uh, deposits. So it's kind of crazy. It's crazy land. And it, really, the backdrop is the, the consumer isn't that leveraged. And they're get, now getting the fiscal benefit from the government who's putting things on their balance sheet. Government can't raise interest rates. So that money is slowly seeping into digital assets. It's just a, that our play. Yeah. You know what's really ironic about this, uh, like the super low interest rate environment, yield curve control, financial oppression, when central banks set the limit of set interest rates at zero, they've essentially destroyed the time value of money, which in addition to causing a bubble in long duration assets, it also just completely screws up capital allocation. And if you look at some of the interest rates that are getting paid out in crypto, what's funny is that in one way, there are these super long duration assets. So you could easily say, well, you know, this looks like a bubble, but there's actually a real cost of capital in that industry, which is completely missing from financial markets in general. It's kind of this funny mix, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why it might, might actually be a generational wealth transfer. They're trapped in this system. They can't change it because they promised so much stuff from, you know, Congress and, you know, baby boomers are aging, you get Medicare, Social Security, pensions, like there's so many things that they have to pay and they need to jimmy the system with fiat currency. So that's sort of what's, it's, it's just going to stay here. Like I don't, if they want free markets again, then watch out. We'll pay attention to it. We'll see, we'll watch the credit indicators when they start ticking up. CDS spreads are slowly ticking up. Um, we'll watch those and it, then we'll say get out of digital assets when that happens. But for now it's kind of game on. We just saw central bank balance sheets. They're at a new high. Like, let me see. They're at, was it $30 trillion? When you add in the fed ECB bank of Canada, bank of England, Swiss national bank, world bank of Australia and people's bank of China, 30 trillion just made a new high this week. Wow. I, yeah. You know, in, in this Felix Zuloff interview with Grant Williams, uh, I don't know, nine months ago or something, you know, he kind of gets on and says, oh, you know, just talking about the U.S., the Fed's uh, balance sheet, like uh, it could be 40, 50 trillion. And it was, oh, my God, that seems like this impossibly high number. 
now it seems like there's a very straightforward path right to that number. And that doesn't seem ludicrous at all. It actually is just, yeah, I kind of hear that number and think that makes a lot of sense. Actually, at some point we're going to get there. So, and, and if you look at the chart, it's like this, it's a parabolic rise. And so everyone else is calling it a bubble, every other asset a bubble, but it's just following that, that same trail. So until you see that tick down, it's hard to be bearish. Yeah. So I think just to bring it back to what we were originally talking about, you know, I think, I think, right. The thing to watch, uh, in the treasuries, just what is the percentage of, of purchases and demand that's coming from international buyers, right? Because I, I guess the real big question is, and this is really unanswered and unknown, but how, how many treasuries can the fed just continue to buy? Um, and at a certain point, it, it's almost like a game of, uh, you know, you know, poker or something, because the, the Fed can probably buy as many treasuries as they want, but then they got to call it yield, cur yield curve control at some point, which they really don't want to do. And then it's just more naked financial repression, as opposed to relying on international creditors to continue to finance us, which they've been doing for 75, 80 years, whatever. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. think they'll actually overtly say it, um, because then you get into the Japanese world, where yeah. Okay, now you're officially like a centrally planned economy. And I don't think they want to go there. They're, they're the reserve currency. It's got to be some weird political thing, you know? I think they'll just increase purchases and, and act like it's not yield curve control. Yeah. I guess that really is the, at the end of the day, when it's something like yield curve control, people talk about the impact of financial oppression and different asset classes and what's going to perform and what's not. And this isn't technically fair to savers and it's a transfer of wealth. But really, at the end of the day, it's 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 whether or not this is a free market economy or a centrally planned economy. That seems to yeah. be really at the core of yield curve control to me. I don't know if you agree. I completely agree. And and you know what, this a semi centrally planned economy is. I, I don't know how to feel about it because at one side you need the government to incentivize like new technologies. Otherwise, yeah. like all the money is going to go. We've talked about this ad nauseum, but. It, you dance a fine line here of like, you know, owning your entire market. Like Japan owns its like most of its treasuries and also like ETFs now. So at that point, it just turns into a Ponzi scheme or Ponzi finance, in my opinion. So you got to tiptoe that line as a government. Yeah. You know, he's got a great, I mean, we had Jeff Booth on the interview portion of the podcast this, uh, this week. And, you know, his contention basically is that the, the most, impactful um, input to the inflation versus deflation in its technology. And technology is essentially driving this huge wave of deflation. Uh, and that's contrasted with our economy is built on uh, actually a requirement for at least some amount of inflation, right? Central banks actually target 2% inflation because the link of you know one person's spending is one person's income. So you actually want there to be some modest amount of inflation. The problem is that's at odds with what's happening in the world of technology. Um, that's causing deflation and the government basically intervening is the attempt to reconcile these two incompatible uh, dynamics. And the more that the government interferes, the more inequality gets created. Cause that's, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Are you going to talk about demographics? Cause we, we no, no, it was more, it's more of like a philosophical question, but like what really happens is technology deflationary or are you just reallocating the pie? Like when you create Uber, you're just taking this guy's job over here and you're creating, you know, is that deflationary or is that, you know, you're just stealing it from another part of the economy? Yeah. I, I don't know. You know I mean, look, Jeff, yeah, Jeff's a really smart guy. I, I mean, he, he argued the, the point very eloquently. He wrote this whole book, The Price of Tomorrow. I personally, I, you know, when I guess it is almost a philosophical argument because when you talk about technology and innovation accelerating today, I feel like that's a subjective thing. How do you even measure something like that? And it's because you take a lot of developments that have occurred in the past and you take it for granted, right? Like you wouldn't look at something and say the sewage system of a city, that's cutting edge technology. But guess what? That was a very boring infrastructure piece of technology that allowed us to live in cities. And to me, living in cities, you know, going from a nomad to an agrarian, like living in cities type society, that's a bigger change than like, software like you know what's going on with my iphone i don't care i get it it's a computer we look at all the time i think there have been bigger changes that have happened in the past and you just you take it for granted because 
you know, you have them today and they don't even look high tech anymore. So yeah, I don't know. All right. So let's move on from yield curve control here. Start talking about, um, the biggest thing that happened, at least in, in crypto this week, uh, which was Coinbase's share started trading as the direct listing debuted on Wednesday, shares started trading around 1 30 PM Eastern time on Wednesday. Uh, you know, the reference price for the direct listing was $250 a share. Um, they essentially went live and started trading immediately at 380 per share. They hit a high of about 420 uh, before closing down at 328, valuing the company on a fully diluted basis at $85 billion, which made Coinbase's direct listing the largest ever um, of its kind, eclipsing Palantir, Roblox, and Spotify. Um, so I guess the last, I mean, I think what might be interesting in when it comes, because so many people have talked about this, like ad nauseum at this point, it's great. It's a bellwether for the industry. I think it would be cool to talk about like the winners and losers of the direct listing, like who benefits from this and who does not benefit. Um, you know, one, one thing that people aren't really talking about is uh, if you look at other public market proxies um, for, uh, for crypto. So if you look like their shares are all down actually. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Silvergate, they're down about 17%. MicroStrategy down about 17%. Voyager down 10%, 11%. Um, so it does seem like some of the demand um, in public markets for crypto exposure that was going to these um, other companies is now getting sopped up by Coinbase. Um, so yeah, you, you see that a lot with IPOs is, you know, once the supply kind of increases in a certain sector, or, mm -hmm. or there's that name brand that comes out, everyone wants to own that and all the other ones kind of go by the wayside. We'll see, you know, it's, uh, I, there, I, I don't know the valuations of all those things and I haven't dug into it. I just know that they've been, you know, proxies for, for digital assets in general, but something tells me that it's not the end for, for MicroStrategy and, and Silvergate and all those, those companies. No. No, oh my God, Silvergate. So we had Alan Lane on on a webinar this week, the CEO at Silvergate. What they're doing with Silvergate Exchange Network, Send and Send Leverage is pretty revolutionary stuff. And they yeah. got there first, and it is very exciting. It is very cool. Um, so yeah, I would not be shorting Silvergate stock anytime soon. <laughs> no. And talk <laughs> about sure. like supply and demand. Like that seems more monopoly like mm. than anything else. Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, still on the subject of winners and losers, I guess to me, the biggest group of quote unquote losers from this um, are traditional financial services companies. So there's this graphic that got passed around social media quite a bit, you know, that by assets, Coinbase would be the biggest, you know, within the top 10 banks in the world. That's a little bit misleading. Coinbase is not trying to be a bank. I think if anything right now, they're most, most comparable to a brokerage like Charles Schwab or something like that. But at the same time, I mean, the sheer numbers that this company is putting up is absolutely incredible. And if you compare Coinbase to apples to apples to, you know, a huge brokerage like Charles Schwab, Charles Schwab has about 30 million accounts. Coinbase has 56. I mean, it's just incredible. And it's funny because you've got like Goldman taking uh, Coinbase public and, you know, Coinbase is now larger than, the, than, than Goldman in a lot of respects. In, in 10 years or eight years. Yeah. In that that is the biggest shot. Like I don't care if you're overvalued or undervalued, and all the, the the valuation guys can go back and forth all day on this stuff. But there's a tectonic shift in the way you raise capital, the way kind of financial services are. Like this gives a whole new way, way to raise capital. You don't even have to access the public markets or use Goldman Sachs. Like you can look at what Uniswap did. Right. I mean, we're going to talk about that eventually, but there's a whole nother system you can use to finance yourself. And yeah. the bigger it grows, you have these behemoths now. And that's the big thing of what Coinbase just did is it it really disrupted everything and made everyone go, holy crap. This company, Goldman, has been around for 150 years and Coinbase's market cap almost surpassed it. Maybe it did for a brief second. Uh, during the trading day, but in eight years, like what with 3% of the employees that Goldman has. So, and I know like the bears are going to, about Coinbase are going to come out and say, oh, their fees are too high and everything. What are Goldman's fees? Like if you're talking about secular decline of fees, 
Like at least there's a hurdle rate to get into digital assets and there's security and custody and all these other things that you actually have to pay a fee for. But like I can go to Robinhood, buy a, a stock for free, buy a Fidelity you know, fund for free. Like there is no hurdle rate for public markets anymore. And if the IPO process is now disrupted by direct listings, that's scary. Like that's scary. And if you look at like Goldman's earnings this this week, they made all their money on trading and not lending, and and, and IPOs and SPACs and stuff. That that may continue if we're in this new twenty first century type capital raising, you know, world. But in terms of like, if you're just making money off of trading and not you're you're a bank, you should be lending money, and they're not really lending. So like, what is your business model? It's a really good, it's a really good point. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. I was looking into this earlier this morning, um, but the big, the bear argument, the bear case against Coinbase is exactly what you just said. So if you look at their revenue, 86% essentially comes from transaction fees. Um, if you look at the world of traditional exchanges like ICE, uh, you know, that the, the, the revenue that they generate from fees has been steadily declining, essentially, uh, for a long period of time. Um, it's hard. I actually looked at ICE's financial statements. They don't break it out by um, transaction fees anymore, which is they break it out on the exchange level. They break it out like by exchanges, fixed income services, all that kind of stuff. It's probably intentional that they don't break it out like that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. At the end of the day, crypto is growing like crazy. Brian, so Brian Armstrong also addressed this, right? He's already they already realized this. And they've mm-hmm. come out and said, we expect 50% of our revenue, you know, in the future, undefined time to come from uh, other services like staking, custody, debit cards. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna lie, I don't get debit cards, but stuff like staking makes a lot of sense to me. Custody makes a lot of sense to me because um, it's the price for security and that's still high in this space. Um, yeah, agreed. I think the the credit card thing, we got to get Zach Prince or somebody to talk about this because the, it's the BlockFi's big thing too is the incentive that you can give and lending with with. Well, they said cards. they said debit cards. They actually said he actually said debit cards. Gotcha. This is different because I get consumer credit based on your crypto or getting getting rewards back in Bitcoin or something like that. That makes sense to me. I, but you know debit cards like why would i go spend why do i want to spend my bitcoin i'm not like buying bitcoins that i can spend buy coffee with it Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me in my it's an instant investment in at least becoming a depository institution and they can pay like six percent rates or you know pass that through so it's a better bank you know yeah i don't know it's a good point yeah we'll see Anyway, look, it was a big, it was a big step uh, for the industry overall, and you know the big winners of this obviously were some of the founders. There was, you know, uh, Brian Armstrong went on; he did this live stream with Fred Ersum and uh, Mark Andreessen, which was at least in my, it was a little awkward, I thought, but it, overall, there's some good, good, good information on that. Um, two very bald guys in the form of <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark Andreessen and Brian Armstrong. No, Dude, not, not that might be me next year. This is what happens when you age. Just I know, man. Knock on, find some wood and knock on it. My God. Um, but they look good though. They did look good. They look great. Hey, and yeah, they're clearly doing fine with their lives. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there was some pretty funny. So I guess, so Coinbase was a Y Combinator company. Now the most successful Y Combinator company. Um, or right there with Airbnb. And right before, I guess, he made the application, Brian Armstrong posted on Reddit, uh, hey, he basically proposed the idea of Coinbase. He said, I'm looking for a, a co-founder. And and to be totally fair, the idea that he proposed on that Reddit forum was pretty different than what Coinbase turned out to be. But some of the responses that people wrote to this guy, I mean, just in retrospect, reamed just, him. Reamed him, just shredded <laughs> this guy. And it's like, Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I kind of love that. Like there's nothing better than, you know, someone who pursues their dreams. It's such it's so American and in the face of all the obstacles. You got to yeah. love that. I like he, he you know, one really good moment I thought from the live stream when he was talking about it. He's like, "Look, being a founder, you know, what's hard about this, you know, when you're when you're 3 years in, nothing's working, your co-founder quit." People are suing you. 
nothing's about, like that's that's the hard times and to persevere through that I, that's so that's so tough man yeah so tough. you must really hate working for other people <laughs> and i get that i get that <laughs> yeah exactly i you know i don't know there's actually there's a great anecdote about um uh like Mark Zuckerberg uh, at Facebook, you know, Yahoo essentially put in a, an offer of $4 billion at one point to buy them, you know, in the early 2000s. And everyone is just begging Mark Zuckerberg, dude, take this. You know, he had something like 60% equity. He would have been a billionaire right there. Mm -hmm. Could have locked it right in. Um, you know, his board is telling him, his employees, yeah, hey, I've been working for this for a long time, man. This would be great. And he is just like, nope, not going to do it. Imagine the stones that it takes to do something like that. I Yeah, I think it was wasn't it something like Peter Thiel asked him, he said, What would you do if you, you sold it? And he said, I'd probably start up another social network. So he just decided to keep the one he had. <laughs> it's just like Yeah, I, I think I would take it, you'd never see me again. I'd be on the beach in like Fiji somewhere. <laughs> but then I'd be back, you know. <laughs> you'd be back, yeah, with yeah. your next social network. All right, let's talk a little bit about Uniswap um, because I think that's a great continuation actually of this uh, Coinbase story. So they announced that they were um, going to be rolling out their V3 pretty soon, um, which is probably intentional right around the same time that Coinbase has uh, had their direct listing. Uh, you know, V3, it, it's set to air or go live on, on May 5th. Um, I think it would be good to just rehash what what Uniswap really is. Like, what is a decentralized exchange? What does it mean to be an automated market maker? Why is this such a revolutionary model? And then, you know, how should we take this within the context of what's going on with Coinbase? Because you just described Coinbase being this young company relative to a company like Goldman Sachs. It took them eight to ten, you know, 10 years or whatever to build up to where they're at. They've got a fraction of the amount of employees, but almost on the more extreme end, even than that, you see a company Uniswap, which is two years old, has 30 employees, less, uh, 20, whatever it is. And they're doing revenues that are comparable to Coinbase. So let's just describe a little bit about what, you know, decentralized exchanges are, what AMMs are. So basically what, what AMMs are and why people are so ex excited about decentralized exchanges is that they are a replacement or a challenge to the central order book, uh, model for exchanges. So in a central order book model, basically people, you know, buyers and sellers will essentially, you know, place bids um, or asks, right? They want to buy or sell things. And there's essentially this, this long list of different orders or the amounts that they're, that they're doing and the exchanges match up the buyers and the sellers, right? And the depth, uh, the order book depth that people talk about, which is synonymous with liquidity, it, it basically just refers to how many orders there are, right? How long that list is and how large the amounts are. And the longer that list is, the more the amounts are, the more liquidity there is, there's more order book depth, you'll get better execution because there are more buyers and sellers, so it's easier to match. And what these exchanges do is they'll match one for one, right? Uh, so the, the challenge is, and when people talk about liquidity drying up, you know, in, in volatile market conditions, that's because there usually aren't buyers, right? Um, so it's hard if you wanna sell something, there aren't as many buyers buying. Um, Uniswap is a challenge to that entire model, right? So they um, essentially, they've got two contracts that are working and they basically take these pools of liquidity um, and then they ascent, and then they incentivize, um, you know, people to provide liquidity to those pools. So what they basically have is this, um, the, the actual way that price is determined of the assets in the pools is this equation, which I'm not gonna try to explain, frankly, because you don't wanna hear it from me. There are better resources on the internet. Uh, but basically you've got these pools of different assets and when you, you know, as a, as someone who's trying to trade within those pools, um, you are trading against a contract and a pool of assets that already exist. So it's not like one-to-one. -one. It's really interesting because it eliminates the idea of counterparty risk. And it also completely changes the, the revenue model, the business model of these exchanges, right? So no longer do you have one centralized, you know, central order book based, um, you know, matcher of buyers and sellers, but you have to have a, a smart contract um, that you're trading against. And it's just a fascinating dynamic that's happening here because one, you know, you're, you're, you're eliminating counterparty risk. You're adding smart contract risk. So it's TBD um, there, but you, but you really do eliminate a lot of the fees, right? That, that, uh, that a lot of these exchanges have, right? Like listing fees. There's no, there's no listing fee um, to start trading on, on yeah. Uniswap. You can just create a pool. Um, yeah. 
to to relate this, so this I've seen this before in you know legacy markets, public equities, and this is my little two cents on it. But so you you when you had to trade a stock thirty years ago, you went down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, you called your broker, and he was like, "Hey, yeah, what do you want to buy? What do you want to sell?" You know, <laughs> and it was that call that there was a premium on pricing, right? It's kind of like Coinbase is now, right? That's sort of the the relationship. Now, as technology and this thing called Reg NMS happened, it created the national market system where you had to post your best bid and best offer on the the exchange. And you went from a centralized exchange, New York Stock Exchange, to now it wasn't calling up New York Stock Exchange and then selling it on the West Coast on ARCA. So you could buy at $10 and sell at 11 on ARCA. And that's sort of how fragmented the, the markets are in crypto right now. But that all combined so that the best bid and best offer from ARCA basically met in this electronic system. And it mm -hmm. slowly evolved. And basically what happened was now you had, you had brokers that no longer had to be on the stock exchange. They could just be on these desks at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, UBS, whatever they would transact from their desks in New York rather than the centralized platform. Now that slowly got disintermediated by even these algorithm platforms, like there's a thing called LiquidNet. And this is, this is the public market. It's a dark pool of mm -hmm. liquidity, which kind of reminds me of Uniswap, right? And what LiquidNet does is if I have a million shares to buy of Apple, and Wellington has a million shares to sell, I can put it into this pool, this dark pool called LiquidNet, and it will automatically cross those shares at like, say like half a penny of mm -hmm. liquidity. Meaning it used to be like five cents a share to trade if you traded through Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. Now LiquidNet crosses that at like a fraction of the price. And those fees keep dropping. It's, it's incredible. So I think that's sort of what's happening with Uniswap is it's that it's a dark pool of digital assets where you can ex basically trade for n really cheap, cheap prices relatively to a Coinbase. You know, I think that's the next evolution of, of this stuff. It's just markets are eating the world, man. Like as technology grows, pricing power drops. Yeah. And look. I, you can see it in the numbers, right? So if you look at something like Wells Fargo, right? I, you wrote this comparison. I think you were comparing uh, Wells Fargo to blockchain.com. But Wells Fargo has something like 500 billion in assets. They've got 43,000 employees. I'm not sure what they do in terms of revenue. I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, but it's somewhere in the bill. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're this ancient company, right? It took them, they've literally been around for hundreds of years. It took It's taken them a long time to get to this point. Then you've got V2, right, in the form of Coinbase. And that's a company that looks like it's gonna do, you know, somewhere between six and eight billion in revenue uh, the first year that it goes public. So it took them 10 years to get there. They've got, you know, over 200 billion of assets in under custody and they've got 1300 employees. You think, whoa, that's a huge step forward in terms of just efficiency um, and, and the time it took to generate that value. But then you've got Uniswap that is even one step further and it's two years you know 20 or 30 employees and i don't know what their total value locked which i guess would that's their version of assets under management but in terms of revenue right now they're operating they're doing like 200 million a month in revenue right yeah, we, so we gotta get point, that's insane we gotta get them on the podcast and ask them about this, some of these numbers but maybe they'll yeah. disclose it but that's yeah it's nutty it's nutty. it's nutty it's completely insane so it's and just so funny. scale becomes easier as you know, the fees to in liquidity grows. Right. And I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, I agree. So they've got V3 rolling out. Um, you guys should go check it out. They put a blog out basically explaining that there's a, one of the new developments is there's this thing called concentrated liquidity. It's going to enable more capital efficiency on the platform. And the, and, you know, the other difference is there's more um, discretion that I guess LPs, right, or people that are providing liquidity, liquidity providers, that they can set more parameters around um, prices as well. So go check it out. It's, it's pretty interesting what's going on there. And then just the last story here is we've got more um, kind of hedge fund greats uh, moving into crypto. And so we've oh, got yeah. two 
two to talk about uh, right now, which is uh, one is Dan Loeb, the other is Brevin Howard. Uh, so Dan Loeb, who runs Third Point LLC, which manages about $17 billion, uh, is moving into Bitcoin on March 1st uh, of this year. So about 45 days ago, uh, Dan announced that he was undergoing a deep dive into Bitcoin. Recent regulatory filings revealed that uh, about five of his fund, he holds five funds at, at Coinbase uh, and now holds some undisclosed amount of cryptocurrency, which is pretty interesting. Um, big win for Coinbase. Um, you know, there's a Dan Loeb, you know, very well known hedge fund guy, but also Paul Tudor Jones, um, you know, has some some funds at, at Coinbase and Eric Peters, you know, and he made that billion dollar Bitcoin and ETH buy, he used Coinbase to do it. So they're clearly winning the hearts and minds of, um, you know, the institutional class. For big sure. Win. Big win for that, Coinbase. Them and Nidig, you know, they are just crushing on that end. They, and, Nidig but, is just yeah. it's fascinating to watch. They have just come out of the woodwork. And, you know, I, I they started operating, I guess, you know, to my understanding, like 2017. I did not hear that. I did not hear the word Nidig until... 2019. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, can you talk about the evolution of this? Like, you guys basically started 2017, right? Yeah. And what it's felt like from that point to now where, you know, Dan Loeb and uh, Brevin Howard getting in the mix. And that's just like, okay, you know, another one. But like, what is that like from 2017? Yeah, I will say, I mean, it's been interesting to watch the development of companies and one one thing that I really believe like I think it's appropriate to look at the internet as an analogy here and a lot of the gen one and nothing against the gen one crypto companies but you know if you look at gen one of the internet a lot of the, the quote unquote Facebooks right that didn't happen until years and years and years down the line and I will just say anecdotally within within my time uh, at crypto and within crypto a lot of the companies that I was just watching get started in 2017 2018. A great example of this is a company like Fireblocks, right? Which they were at one point kind of the new kids on the block. They recently raised $100 million and they are literally ubiquitous. And I think one of the things that's so exciting right now about this recent bull run, yeah, it's great that the price of Bitcoin is going up, but the, the unseen effects of that is the huge amount of capital that these run-ups draw in. So it brings in the next generation of, of capital, but also of entrepreneurs who are building mm -hmm. things. And Nidig is a great example of a relatively recent company. They got drawn in by the last uh, bull run, and now they're just absolutely crushing it because they they got in with insurance companies, um, you know, and they've successfully kind of bagged that whale. And now now that they have Mass Mutual and other insurance companies, um, you know, buying and custodying through them, that's, that's really what you need. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of the big companies, the Facebooks of crypto, I don't think they've even been created yet. I don't even think yeah. they've, you know, we'll see. Maybe Coinbase is the Google, is, is, is crypto's Google, but maybe Google doesn't exist yet. And do, talk about this for a second, but like you mentioned Uniswap is relatively new company. To, mm -hmm. the, the fact that like it took Amazon, what, 20 years to get to, to be Amazon, mm -hmm. it seems like the timeline is condensing Maybe because the financing is there for these companies and the technology is also so advanced that you can just create something so fast. Is that accurate? Okay. So you're bringing up a really, really good point. So even if you look at something like Amazon, it took 20 or, or I guess, you know, 25 years for it to become Amazon. That's way shorter. That's like, if you look at how long it took for Walmart to be Walmart, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a condensed timeline from that. Um, but the reason why these crypto companies are going so fast is because of the bootstrapping mechanism that tokens allow. So if you look at Gen 1 of crypto, that was kind of ICOs, right? And the fundraising mechanism there was, it, it was it was a scammy kind of wrapper on, on something that already exists, right? It was just, hey, we're gonna raise a you know hundreds of millions of dollars and throw it into this, this token. But what's really interesting about these companies, you know who's a great example of this is Aave. Aave is a phenomenal example of this where token, the issuance of token tokens are really good for two things. It's one, it's aligning incentives, um, but it's also between, because your, your investors and your users of the platform are the exact same thing. And you can essentially sell that equity slash ownership. 
And then there are these huge network effects and totally aligned incentives because then every single, you know, people talk about making your employees at a company feel like ownership over mm -hmm. now it's you expand that to your customers, right? So every customer is also an investor and has a direct, you know, uh, incentive to spread the word and increase adoption of the product. And you're watching these bootstrapping effects just take place. And Aave has grown to this behemoth in the span of one year. And you're not doing it by raising huge funds from VCs. This is essentially customer bootstrap growth. And mm -hmm. we've never seen anything like it. It's a completely new dynamic. Um, S speaking of which, I got a little tutorial on BitClout um, this week. Holy crap. I mean, this company, number one, backed by Sequoia and Dreesen, uh, was it Winklevoss, I think Pantera, they, they're creating basically a fundamental value for every human, like where you can trade Mike Ippolito tokens and essentially it ascribes a value to your social, you know, market value to your social network. Yeah. Which I'm, is scared, just, I'm scared to check what that is for me. Yeah, it's like two cents for me. I don't leave my house. Yeah. Not Yano. Yano's, Yano's going to be swimming millions of dollars here. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. You, got, you, got, you got a retweet yesterday from uh, Mark Benioff. Did he? The, uh, yeah, he did. What, on his yeah. uh, engagement? No, not on the engagement, on like a Jim oh. Cramer post or something. Oh, nice. But yes, <laughs> uh, our co-founder, Jason Yano, he is engaged. So you can find him at Yano on Twitter. Give him a big thumbs up. He'd love to hear from you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he bagged a good one. We love her. She's, she's great. Dana's awesome. Congrats. Um, yeah. Um, well, oh, and then I, look, the last thing I want to cover is Brevin Howard moving in here as well. So Brevin yeah. Howard, it, Brevin Howard's a really big deal, actually. So Brevin Howard, um, at one point, he ran one of the largest macro funds um, in the world. He managed, mm -hmm. I think in 2013, he managed $40 billion in assets. That's down to about $10 billion now. He's been a pretty... Um, He's been quiet, but he's been an advocate of, of crypto and Bitcoin for a long, long time. Um, he launched something called Elwood Management, um, which is kind of Brevin Howard's crypto arm. Looked like they were going to be a big deal for a little while. They've been a little quiet, but recently he's been more and more uh, involved in the space. In March, um, it was announced that he took a really large, like $61 million position in CoinShares, which theoretically he's done well on now that they're public. Um, he also is, is a big backer of Eric Peters fund, um, one river digital. So he's got exposure there and now it looks like he's, um, you know, there are some Brevin Howard's funds that are potentially getting exposure to Bitcoin directly. So incredible. Yeah. Incredible. He's a big deal in the macro community. It's just more, it's just good to get more of these guys involved. To be honest. What's so funny is that these guys probably own Bitcoin three, four years ago, personally. I mean, most, most guys that I know in the hedge fund world own it personally, but compliance wouldn't let them own it in the fund mm -hmm. unless it's GBTC or something at the time. But my guess is if you're a billionaire, you're already, you know, putting money into, you need to put money into super scalable things that are going to be in the future if you're that wealthy, because yeah. like, unless you're just lazy and don't care about markets, like you don't want 5% return. Like you're not going for that with the portion of your portfolio. And like these guys were all investing in it personally, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. it's almost like, okay, now we got our position on, now we're going to go public and say, you know, we're, we're investing in it. And, and that's what I, I don't know if you caught Larry Fink on CNBC this week, but he like fumbled. He, he, this was great. There was a book I, I read from FBI, uh, uh, head of terrorists, terrorism. He, he, it's called what everybody is saying. Mm. He says, your limbic system uh, hasn't changed in thousands of years as a human. But your words, you can say something different, but your body can't tell any difference. So what, what Larry Fink happened uh, on CNBC was like, he said, you know, we're not getting any institutional. No, no one's, no one is, uh, and he's shaking his head back and forth. Like, no one wants to invest in Bitcoin. Like they, we haven't gotten any interest on, in, in Bitcoin and you could just tell he was just straight up lying because <laughs> this guy, I mean, he, it's tough to tiptoe if he, he's one of the biggest asset managers in the world. If he says he's getting into crypto, everyone's going to front run him. If he, he wants to build a position before everyone probably knows or, or open a fund, it, it's just funny. And not only that, but 
he is essentially a centralized player in asset management at this point. You're so big that you're centralized. So by you saying overtly you're investing in it, you're kind of saying my business model is toast because we can't scale anymore. Mm. And I, I think a lot of these like small hedge funds are probably just hoovering up Bitcoin now and they're all going to come the next month. You got Dan Loeb, you know, Alan Howard, uh, pretty much all the big wigs where you, you have coverage career risk wise if you're like a smaller hedge fund at this point to just mm. get on board. I completely agree. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, man. It'll be interesting to see. And even if you look at like getting back to Coinbase, I mean, they're, I forget what it is, uh, you know, like 30% of their business, 40% of their business is institutional at this point. So it's big. big. Yeah. Um, all right, man, what are you up to this weekend? Any big plans? Where um, are you, by the way? Look at this nice background. This looks so yeah, nice. I, I just like noticed, do I look like I'm camouflage here? I'm doing a little too much. <laughs> like, look like a floral, uh, I don't know. You look Can lovely. You see me? I'm like, you look lovely. lovely. I see you. I see you bright and clear. It's the yeah. clearest day. Um, <laughs> it's kind of gloomy out behind us here in Texas. It looks like. Yeah. Gloomy. Yeah. The storms here. There, oh, here's an interesting tidbit. Mm. Up north of me a little bit, there is a uh, grapefruit sized hail that was coming Yikes. out. Yikes. Grapefruit? Yeah. Am I thinking about the right fruit? <laughs> hail. The storms here are, are nuts. Like, in California, like if there was like a, a light dusting of rain when I lived there, people were like, everybody watch out, it's raining. <laughs> Here it's like, dum, 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 you know, and like you, you like get into your covers and pull the sheet out. <laughs> I mean, you kind of get it in New York. There's some big thunderstorms, but. Um, yeah, there are some big thunderstorms there, but. Yeah, what, do, what yeah. are you up to this weekend? I don't know, man. I'm, what am I doing? Uh, actually, you know, we are, I've, I've got a friend where, so. You've heard me talk about this outdoor space we got here, but we're hosting a, a birthday party uh, for him um, over here. So we're gonna do some grilling. It depends. It depends how much, uh, how many drinks are had. We might, we might, we might, we might try to grill, or we might just uh, end up ordering from somewhere. Um, What's your drink of choice? No, sorry, sorry there's a fly. It. That's my drink of choice. Uh, I mean, for something like this, I just go with beer, Old Faithful. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll, but I do like an old fashioned. Um, it's a little cliche being a good, good winter drink. Good winter yeah. drink. Yeah, I'm onto yeah. the tequila kick. A little mezcal action. Mezcal is great. Yeah, oh, okay. actually, I've I've been digging the like the mezcal or like a spicy margarita or something like that. That is. Um, that's oh yeah, bad. yeah. It's my go-to. Now. Uh, look, I'm I'm also I'm secure enough in my masculinity. I like a I like a pink for like a fruity drink every now and again. You know, they're just Vacation. delicious. They're just yeah. delicious. Yeah, yeah. Summer, it's getting to, you know, it's springtime. We're getting into summer. You know what I miss is those New York City rooftop summertime. Like yeah. spring, summertime. It's awesome. They're coming back. And you know what else? There are these big, I imagine this happened because of the pandemic, but there are these huge, you know, like outdoor turf areas that have these kind of nice umbrellas and TVs and stuff all outside. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. So, That's awesome. yeah. I'm excited. I'll go spend uh, twenty five dollars a drink uh, there at some point this weekend. But, uh, <laughs> is is New York City dying? What's the pulse there right now? It is not dying at all. That was, you know, what the worst takes in retrospect of this COVID stuff. You know, when people are like, "There's no normal to go back to." You remember that? People are like, "There is no normal." Yeah. Yes, there's a normal. It's coming right, right back one year later, and you know, <laughs> these all these talks about New York dying, it is exploding here. The last couple weekends, so I'm in Williamsburg and. You know, it's as busy as I can ever remember seeing it. And it's not even that warm yet. So I think when it actually gets warm, people, it's going to be crazy here. Um, yeah. And anecdotally, there's no inventory. If you're trying to move here, I mean, all the, all the inventory is getting hoovered up um, as well. Dude, you want to so. hear something crazy? Hit me. So this is, this is just how nutty it is. In, in, I bought my house for 577 grand, probably too much i'm just going to disclose it because this is how this is how crazy it is this was a year and a half ago and i it was like 2018 when the fled fed flip-flopped and i was like you know what i'm getting punished for saving money like the fed's just going to keep printing and it, I, I was holding out because i thought they were going to like raise rates and like everything was going to reset and i was kind of bearish and, and and let free markets happened and then they flip-flopped and i was like 
screw it. Let's just buy a house. Let's get the hell out of California. And because the cost of living was insane, taxes were going up, everything, you know, you, you know the deal. So we moved here right before the big exodus came, bought this house, nice suburban area, pretty middle class area, 577 grand. House around the corner, same size, same thing, just listed for 1.25. This is in under two years. It's almost like doubled. And I'm like, nice. that's why... If they don't let rates rise, this is gonna. This is like straight up Ponzi finance, and it, it happens. I think QE's main driver is real estate. Mm. Like that's where it really goes because you get the leverage and the credit. But I, to me, I'm just like this is mind blowing, and it's. I I, I don't know how it ends. I I agree. Hey, my parents. My parents are moving to Montana actually, and I will not you know maybe reveal as much information, but I will say they sold their house. It, it didn't even hit the market. It didn't even, they, were, they weren't even done interviewing different brokers to talk to. And the second one they talked to, you know, it's like, hey, I've got someone who might be interested. They came in, offered above asking, and they were like, boom. You know, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, the, the amount of- What is fiat offers. money anymore? What's debt? You know, like, know. we're asking ourselves these questions. Yeah, governments should be worried if people are asking themselves those questions. You don't want right. people asking those questions, I think. Well, Last thing I want to end on, which was early this morning, Turkey basically outlawed uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. And Turkey, as we know, is just like a horrible uh, run financial. Like they were seriously sure of U.S. dollar debt. You know, their currency has been really beaten up uh, and they banned Bitcoin. So will banning Bitcoin essentially give it a tacit approval because it's it's basically a sign that you ran your government into the ground, right? And you're gonna join Erdogan, who's a known like dictator, I guess, in global world world policy. Like if you ban Bitcoin next, oh, it's like you and Erd Erdogan, you know. <laughs> so you're now joining like a guy who ran his country into the ground. Yeah, and that's interesting. To me, I'm like it's a it's almost like a game theory thing where. The worst is going to ban it first, and then it just follows down the line. So maybe it's not as bad for the U.S. You know, maybe, maybe the U.S. and Bitcoin end up as, you know, hand in hand. As one <laughs> is the heart, in case you can't. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I mean, we covered this with Peter Thiel's talk list. I, I don't think he's doing this five D chess that a lot of people think he's doing, but I think, and yeah, Bitcoin ends up being more positive for the U.S. than not. But, mm -hmm. all right, man, this has been a good roundup. Um, I will let you get back to it. I'll see you uh, same time next week. Till next week. All see right. you, bud. Take care.